heard earlier about um, migration, you know, sticking to the theme of uh, towards a shared future, people, innovation, and collaboration. Where are we in terms of migration? What are the different things that we need to think about? And then the second session, where are we in terms of climate change? You know, it, it is very urgent. Um, so my question to you, Aminaji, to begin is, what are the different linkages, of, uh, linkages between climate change and migration in the Himalayan region? Thank you so much, Diva. Um, good to be speaking about it after the earlier two presentations. Um, thank you, Pietro and Flip. Now, I think uh, His Excellency Pietro has very nicely mentioned about migration and development. Now let me put the link between migration and climate change, how it is important. At Isimut, we have been trying to resource this link for over a decade now. And uh, what we find is migration can be diverse. When you are talking about displacement, that is also kind of migration. And with displacements, there is a very direct link or attribution uh, towards the climate change or extreme events. But when it comes to labor migration, then this debate and this continuous uh, interest on the link continues even now. And, uh, let me share with a very recent research that we have conducted, and this is also reflected in the HIMAP uh, assessment report. What we found is, earlier we always said, it is always believed that climate change does not have a direct or a strong link with migration decisions. But in this research, in, across the four river basin, Indus, Brahmaputra, and, uh, what did I mean, Ganga, Ganga. So, uh, four countries. Uh, we then tried to measure the perceptions because this is in Himalayas, it's a co communities of informality and the countries of informality. So, a lot of migration actually takes place also based on the perception and the experiences. And what was fascinating was we found a direct contribution of perception of change in temperature, change in precipitation, and the number of dry days. Uh, on the migration decision of the households. Not only that, but also the past experience, not, the, not immediately, because we found that lagged difference, you know, the past experience of loss of property and temporary displacement due to extreme climate, uh, you know, events also have an impact on the migration decision. Now, here, let me just give a quick example of 2015 earthquake that has not to do with climate change per se, but a disaster. And we were, when I was in the field trying to understand, you know, this link is, is all the men and a lot of women below 40 were very clear that we have lost so much that in order to recover, there is no option but to go out because the opportunities that is available locally will not be sufficient to recover the kind of uh, loss that we have faced. And this is something we found also in this study. So there is actually a strong linkage between climate change and migration. Though often, like, if you go and ask people, probably that will not come up. The most important uh, reason people give is in, in uh, economic factors. The environment doesn't come up. But when you, we, we try to uh, address this, considering the perception, that's when the uh, picture started to be uh, very clear. Similarly, there is also the reverse imp uh, influence of migration on climate change adaptive capacities of the households. Uh, as Pietro mentioned earlier, the link between development is more or less clear and people do. It is complex, but at least uh, we know that there is a link between uh, migration and development. And we also find similar positive link between migration and climate change adaptation. So migrant households were more likely to adapt to climate change. So they were at least reporting doing something to reduce the negative impacts of uh, climate change uh, as uh, against the non-migrant household. So those uh, links are there, but what is important is it is not a linear link, is this? Because so much, for us, you know, we have, we tend to think in our own disciplines, in silos, but for a household, it's their livelihood strategy that they take up in order to uh, deal with S lots of changes, not only climate change, but also the socioeconomic, political, the whole globalization. So it's very important that this complexity is there. So it, in certain ways, they are better off. In other ways, migration actually erodes resilience. But these connections are very much prevalent. Great, thank you. So when you're talking about um, the connection, 
Um, let's talk a little bit about the impact that this is actually happening, right? So we can look at it from the perspective of migration as well as a little bit from the perspective of forced displacement because of disaster. So Paul, my question to you is, can you talk a little bit more about some of the socioeconomic and political uh, impact this is happening, this is ha having on communities, nations uh, at large? Um, I think this is uh, such a broad question and it's difficult to answer, but uh, I think I'd like to focus on the impact part of the question. Uh, I think a lot of this is obvious to many of us, and I'd like to focus down even more on the types of migration. And as the two previous speakers uh, very well stated it uh, in their interventions, uh, there are basically three forms of migration that we're looking at when we look at climate change, and then we can look at what is the impact. Uh, we have uh, autonomous migration or migration that's voluntary. That could be labor migration, uh, but it could also be rural to urban. It could be other forms of migration, internal or external. Uh, people do move for uh, a purpose and to, uh, as a form of adaptation and as a form of livelihood uh, uh, discovery. And then we've got uh, displacement, uh, which is a uh, can also be internal or cross-border. Uh, in the, uh, the global report on internal displacement from 2018, uh, it stated that disaster-related displacement in Nepal was 384,000 people. So it's fairly significant, and I expect that to increase uh, as we continue down this road uh, uh, very clearly in the, uh, the slides that we just saw from Isamod's report. And then finally, we have planned relocation of communities or individuals. Uh, they may plan for themselves, communities may plan, or the governments themselves may plan. Uh, and I think it's important to say planned because unplanned migration is where we run into many of the severe difficulties. So what is the impact? I think uh, it's, it can be measured in many different ways different metrics. I think what's important to ask are these uh, different forms of migration, uh, planned and displacement and uh, voluntary. Uh, can these be managed better so that we achieve sustainability, so that we achieve uh, a measure of dignity, and so that we ensure that uh, this contributes to development? Great. I'm going to come back to that and ask most likely the same question back to you later. But before that, um, to Joni, um, what, can you talk a little bit more about some of the existing policies um, that recognize this linkage that we're, uh, that we're establishing between climate change and migration? Thank you, Diva. Uh, and it is even more uh, you know, interesting and even more helpful to talk right after the two speakers that have already established climate change and migration linkages, uh, linkages. And now in terms of policy processes, international as well as national, maybe I'll focus more on international uh, uh, at present. Uh, there are, before we get into the policy processes and the legal frameworks internationally available, uh, we have to underscore this fact that uh, there are, you know, increasingly a greater realization in the international policy processes in terms of identifying and creating a linkages with these two policy processes. Uh, for example, uh, in order to, but say that, uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we can now divide in terms of international policy and multilateral responses to these climate change and migration processes. Maybe we can divide it to uh, two uh, parts within climate change regime first, and then on the outside climate change regime, what's going on outside the regime as well. So in terms of internal, within the climate change regime, uh, uh, as Clim United Nations Framework Convention, I, I know I'll be speaking very boring stuff, laws and policies at the international level. Uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is the primarily uh, uh, a legal doc, uh, uh, primarily mandated to address climate change, uh, climate change in the international level. So within that climate change regime, within UNFCCC, the recognitions of migration, um, uh, displacement, and planned relocation was identified in the 
16th conference of the parties for the first time. That is also, we call it a Cancun framework, where uh, it recognizes the role of the state parties to enhance their understanding in, in the linkages of climate change, induced migration, displacement, and also uh, planned relocation, as Paul has already highlighted. So following up on that again, in the Doha round, in the 16th, no, in the 18th conference of the parties, uh, the state parties were even, you know, uh, encouraged to understand and create the linkages between, between these policy processes within these um, uh, uh, domains, climate change, migration, displacement, and um, planned relocation. But w uh, in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, which was adopted in the 2015, it was envisioned, it was um, expected that the world community would respond and explicitly recognize uh, migration and climate change linkages in the text of the Paris Agreement itself, but unfortunately we failed uh, in recognizing the explicit recognitions of these linkages. Whereas other earlier two processes were the COP decisions, and this is, uh, Paris Agreement is within the uh, UNFCCC con context. So in that connection, many climate watchers often say it's a missed opportunity in terms of establishing a robust uh, linkages on climate change and migrations. Uh, that's in the uh, UNFCCC processes. But then at the same time, on the same year, uh, there was a, uh, in a COP decision in 2015 itself, uh, a task force on displacement was um, created that was mandated to, you know, uh, un to, to foster understanding and linkages between all these climate change, uh, migration, relocation, and planned relocation and, uh, and displacement. So with the major task of, the task for itself is to, you know, foster that understanding in a, within state parties at, at different scale, at national, regional, and the international scale. And uh, the role of the IOM is commendable in that. It is leading that processes in creating and fostering that understanding at the, in, the, in the global level. So beyond, uh, this is, I think, um, this is the, within the UNFCCC processes. But then, um, in a nutshell, what we can say is, Though climate change, migration linkages is considered a, a tabooed concept to be discussed in the formal negotiation processes, but it has in one way or the other, uh, uh, und I mean, uh, underscores the importance of recognition as well. So that's within the uh, climate change processes. When it comes to outside that, in the migration community, let's say, there are many other processes going on. For example, we can take, uh, for instance, global compact on migration that we've recently, UN General Assembly has adopted, uh, endorsed the uh, compact as well. That provides a very comprehensive response to migration in general, and also it has identified its linkages with climate change, displacement, and migration. So that's a very um, uh, uh, important document that we have internationally available. But th said that it's a, it's a, um, uh, GN, uh, it's a, it's not a legally binding document, so, uh, but then it has a political process. It has a political, because of its endorsement by the General Assembly of the U United Nations itself, it gives more of a political force and bindingness to the, uh, to the states. On the other hand, there are, there are many other policy processes going on. For example, though in an academic level, uh, there are voices of, uh, even in renegotiations of the uh, refugee conventions and others are also on, on the process because I have, a, I have to sort it down to uh, process. There are many other processes, but then we have to understand the linkages and the processes in between these all parallelly going processes is questionable that we need to work more to strengthen the regime. Thank you. Right, so it seems as if um, this becomes more of a multifaceted issue, right? There's no direct climate change leads to this particular output outcome or anything like that. Um, and as you mentioned, IOM has been leading the way in that regard. So Paul, can you talk a little bit more about um, what you guys are doing in, uh, uh, on this issue of migration within the context of climate, climate change? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, IOM, uh, 
was basically founded to respond to forced uh, displacement, uh, to dislocation of people and communities. It's in our DNA. We work on emergencies and post-crisis, post-disaster. Uh, this is uh, our greatest experience, and I think one of the greatest strengths is the operational side. But as I see, we have developed uh, institutionally, we increasingly work um, uh, at, the, at the practical level, but also at the policy level. Uh, we're doing uh, several things here in Nepal as well as in the region on the practical level, uh, and we've got institutional um, clusters of the camp coordination, camp management, and I don't think it's necessary to go into these. Uh, I think it is more interesting to look at the policy uh, and programmatic level of governments and communities and institutions like those represented here. Uh, and in terms of what we should be focusing on, I think, it's threefold. And uh, it would be uh, to prevent forced migration as far as that is achievable. Uh, it is going to be difficult to do because environmental factors will overcome the capacity to prevent all forms of forced migration. I think that is inevitable. Uh, if we look at the, the, the glacial melt alone, and the water issues in the mountains, this is going to impact severely on mountain communities. And what do you do? What is the answer to that? How do you prevent forced migration? How do you turn it into something that can be more positive uh, uh, if it's better planned? The second is to provide assistance and a protection uh, and durable solutions when you have forced migration. People who have been forced out of their communities or their homes and their locations are extremely vulnerable. We need to find ways to ensure that there is a safety net for them and uh, a protective, uh, protective measures are in place institutionally, legally, and uh, socially. And the third is, uh, I mentioned it already, is planned migration as a climate change adaptation strategy uh, to enhance both the resilience and the development. Uh, of the country and the communities themselves. Without planning, uh, it, will not be, uh, it will not be in the interest of anyone, short term or long term. Great, thank you. Um, so this, this kind of brings up a little bit of the question in terms of what's actually happening at the community level, right? So we can talk about policies, we can talk about uh, programs that we're designing, thinking larger context, uh, the communities that the people are migrating from, leaving or are being displaced, or the communities that are actually also receiving um, these, uh, these individuals. At the national level, we can talk about communities, but it could be countries of origin and countries of where they destination, right? So in that regard, um, Amina, can you talk a little bit more, more about um, some of these uh, challenges and vulnerabilities that have quite been highlighted earlier as well, but from your experiences, from the studies that you guys are conducting, um, what are some of these vulnerabilities in, in the communities where the individuals are just migrating from and the communities where uh, they are going to? Um, and I'm more curious to kind of learn about it from the perspective of resources, right? Because when you're talking about migration, there's a massive um, amount of resources that we're also having to share. So what does it uh, mean in terms of resources such as water, land, food, um, and how can we, in Paul's term, better prepare for some of these challenges? So, um we're not talking about migration. We often get, because it is so easy to count, we get somehow caught up in remittances and then forget about the rest. But it's so important to understand the rest. If, uh, if uh, as Paul, you rightly mentioned about, you know, if planned migration can be an adaptation strategy. And since you wanted me to highlight a bit more about the challenges, but before that, I just want to say that uh, the advantage of migration is, particularly in climate change adaptation, because it gives a household specially diversified income source. So let's take an example of yesterday, Bara Parsa, so much of uh, destruction. But if they have a member somewhere, let's say, in the in east, somewhere in the east, in Hetoda, or even in Kathmandu, then you have a source of income that this family can still depend on. And this is where migration becomes so important. But having said that, I'm just back from Mohottari, and I was fascinated because we went there to see this early warning system and how effective it can be. 
village after village, village after village, people kept saying that almost all the youth are outside uh, of the village, either outside the country or outside the village within the country. Now, that brings to the very important this uh, discussion today the morning we had about this demographic change. Now the demographic change is coming to the village level. So you have villages full of women, children, and old people. So now let's take an example. We are talking about disaster preparedness. The disaster preparedness I've seen like Senda framework and how it is framed. So it's important to see that communities are not homogeneous. And particularly if you have high migration communities, then these communities are totally different from other communities. Here, we are, and even in, let's say, talk about gender. You want to mainstream gender, you are not only talking about the different roles of men and women anymore. Because now you have households which has only women. They don't have men. Or households which has men, but probably only all men. So how are you going to prepare? How is this category of households? And in high migration pockets, these are not minority five households that the rest of the community can take care. These are the majority households. So how are you going to prepare for a disaster in such a situation? How, I still remember in 2017 floods, uh, there was a heartbreaking story in Kantipur front base with a baby wrapped in a blanket and a dead baby. Um, the story was a migrant's family, two children. One, the mother was carrying and one, she was holding hand and you know trying to run away from the flood. She couldn't, she missed her step and she dropped her smaller child. And the child could not be taken to hospital because the father was not there, he was in India. And the, file, uh, the child died of pneumonia. And if you have to take this STZ, no one should be left behind. That this child should not have died, this mother should not have lost her child. So where is the preparedness? So, you know, this is the things that you don't consider when, uh, when you are preparing DRR, okay, migration is not my domain, it's not important, but migration becomes important when you are talking about that preparedness. How do you deal with that? So uh, similarly, we are, you talk about resources. Now often now, I don't want to touch this topic, but then I'm just going to touch it. Often migration is blamed for everything else. Somebody told today, I think uh, the UN uh, representative here, that the blame game, it's somebody else not doing. And migration is now blamed for all the land, uh, agriculture land abandonment. And even f uh, earlier studies, research have also shown that, but we found out that it's not that it's not international migration has nothing to do with that. What was important was when women migrate internally, then you have a negative impact. And this we verified because in Chitwan we asked village after village, do you have migrants? If almost every household has somebody migrating. Do you have land left fallow? Nothing. Not a single inch of land is left fallow. Because agriculture is so lucrative, why would anybody uh, leave their lands fallow? I mean, you can simply rent out your lands. So. This is where it becomes important. But Lamjung, Nuakot, in he mountain hilly districts, you see patches of land being left fallow. Now, don't bl bl blame migration for that. It has nothing to do with migration. It has more to do with the competitiveness of the agriculture sector. So these are the nuances that we have to understand. We have not understood. And so migration, remittances, it's with the Ministry of Labor, Employment, and Social Securities. We have nothing to do. This notion has to change. Let me stop at that. I, I still want to ask the following question to you, though. Like, what does it mean in terms of the sharing of the resources, though, right? Because um, uh, you're talking about different departments and different uh, ministries handling matters differently. But then when people are migrating, um, especially related to the slow onset, uh, not sudden onset hazards, uh, that is a little bit more difficult to account for. Um, so in receiving communities or in communities uh, or countries of destination, um, how, what have you seen in terms of preparedness um, in terms of sharing the resources? Because we've established that the resources are also, also very limited. Or have you seen anything, I guess? Let me, because in our high map report also, what we have found is when it comes to environmentally vulnerable areas, migration is actually mostly internal. So that's another myth. It's not uh, international, it's mostly internal. And this is nowhere ever discussed. Uh, resources, now I, I don't need to speak, we are all in Kathmandu and Kathmandu is a melting pot for all the migrants and we have seen the level of uh, resource sharing, the kind of services, how you know everything is being uh, stressed and uh, most of the migrants, uh, they don't stay in the most uh, resilient places, be it in Kathmandu or in Dehradun or 
any other Himalayan cities, uh, you name it. Most of them actually go and stay in another vulnerable area. So, and the resources are simply not there. So they have to live with a basic minimum resources and, and then the conflict starts because there is nothing planned. So Kathmandu simply does not have the capacity to take more additional people. But people would come because in order to survive, people would do whatever necessary, right? Uh, and this is where, like, if you're talking about urbanization, people don't consider migration because that, but they forget that that's the major, you know, source of population growth in most of the uh, Himalayan cities. And then, you know, resource planning in uh, receiving areas, if you don't consider that, that's going to lead to conflict. So this is why it becomes so important to consider uh, other dimensions of, of migration uh, apart from remittances alone. Right, right. I think, I think it's really important to keep this in mind because a lot of times when we just talk about migration and climate change or um, we, don't, we don't think about these micro level issues um, that ultimately lead to further, you know, disasters or economic conflict and so on. Um, so now on that, on that note though, to uh, Joni Ji, um, can you talk a little bit, because you've highlighted the policies at the international level and what's been happening, but can you talk a little bit more about how, how, how we're translating those policies um, in Nepal and where are we in terms of actually adapting to it? Mm, thank you, Diva. I, well, we do not, as I already mentioned in terms of uh, the international policy and legal processes, there are no legally binding documents addressing these linkages uh, that are available in the international uh, or global level. So, but then there are, uh, as I highlighted, there are policy processes, for example, I couldn't tell it before, uh, more in detail about the protection agenda now considered as platform for disaster displacement and also the global compact. Those are the policy processes, political processes, but have, uh, because they are endorsed and adopted from more from a consensus building processes that has more of a political, uh, you know, a political bindingness amongst the countries. So in Nepal's context, there are also many processes, policy processes are going on. There are on the way. There are uh, policy processes in terms of uh, climate change regime and also in outside the climate change regime as in the international plane as well. For example, in the uh, in, in national context, we have devised climate change policy and now we are again uh, re, um, drafting a new climate change policy uh, um, that is uh, underway. That's a draft climate change policy. We have as a country party to UNFCCC, we have submitted a nationally determined contribution. Uh, that's more, um, more into legally bindingness that does have. And also we have like, you know, we have com communicated our national communication reports to UNFCCC. Those are the international commitments we have uh, made. But then in terms of creating a linkages uh, with migration and um, displacement or planned relocations, there is nothing much done in the climate change policy processes in Nepal. Whereas in terms of uh, outside the climate change policy processes, there are definitely many things going on. For example, uh, I, I think the IOM and Ishimo themselves have worked on a specialized strategy on migration and climate change linkages, though I think it's in a draft phase and not finalized yet, but that's something, uh, a specialized response that we, we are making in terms of. Uh, there are other policy processes, again, in terms of climate change and, as I said, outside that, uh, translating those and disaster, uh, platform on disaster uh, displacement and other gl global compact. But then the major problem that we can see in, in terms of national policy processes is they do not quite well interact with each other most importantly within the climate change regime. Though outside climate change regime, for example, migration and other policies, they are, I mean, uh, regime, they are trying to integrate the policy, uh, climate change and disaster um, displacement angle within that. But the, within the climate change regime, it's far or less, um, again, a tabooed, con I don't know if it's a tabooed concept or not, but 
that, that's not well discussed within the community. So this underscores the importance why there's importance of sectoral and cross learnings in terms of different sectors and regime that we have. We have created our own umpires, I would say, but then we have not actually broken, uh, broken the wall to interact amongst each other. That actually needs more sort of interactions and connections between convergence on, on different sectors here. Great, I think that's a great segue to my question to you, Paul. Um, so when we're talking about the uh, lack of clarity to, to an extent in terms of what's happening here in, in the country, um, I know IOM is currently working with uh, about 15, is that right, 15 different government ministries and departments on the uh, migration profile of Nepal. So can you talk a little bit more about how, your, um, how this profile is ma mainstreaming migration into policy making and how climate change uh, is integrated into this? Uh, good. Um, yes, we are working with the government on a migration profile. This is a two-year endeavor, and the first step was to uh, put together a technical working group consisting of 15 ministries and departments uh, of the government. One of the problems that Nepal has uh, that is shared by many uh, countries in the region uh, and around the world, I would say, is uh, a certain amount of fragmentation in their approach to migration management. Uh, this is uh, uh, compounded by uh, large, uh, complex uh, emergencies such as climate change. And so part of this is both uh, process and product. Uh, at the end of two years, there will be a very in-depth uh, review of all of the elements of migration uh, and their impacts on, uh, on development in Nepal, as well as gaps. There's a lot of gaps in, in uh, uh, data, uh, statistics, analysis, information sharing between government departments uh, and other institutions in Nepal that have uh, uh, a stake in these issues or have some research and facility with the, uh, uh, the issues. So this is seeking to pull all that together into one, uh, you know, uh, large document that the government can use uh, ultimately to formulate policies that are evidence-based. The second part of this though is really to do exactly that. It's to give the government uh, the opportunity to come together and focus uh, primarily on migration and all of its elements. Under this migration profile they are focusing on climate change and forced displacement uh, as one of the factors in the overall migration picture in Nepal and how that might need to be planned for in the future, as well as what research, uh, data, and statistical analysis needs to be uh, en uh, encouraged uh, going forward because it's either lacking or no one has taken the opportunity to look at it before. Uh, as we saw in the Isamod, what you can't count, then you can't really see or make policy for. Great. So there are gaps that exist. Um, there isn't enough data. Statistics is another challenge. Um, so given all of the complications and intricacies um, and uh, especially pertaining to designing and implementing programs and then you're also thinking about designing policies at the national federal level um, and we speak a little bit in terms of Nepal but I think this is something that can be uh, can be sort of contextualized to the region as a whole um, you know probably a very broad question to you Aminaji but what are some of the ways that we can think about that uh, gap, uh, closing that gap and bringing that collaboration forth I think the most important thing is to change in our mindset. Now, Johnny, you, 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 you use this word taboo, and I actually liked it. Because the moment we talk about migration, and let's be honest, a lot of us within the room also would think, the first thing we think is, how do you stop migration? It's not only at government level. At every level you keep, you go into, the, I have, I've been frustrated with a couple of uh, events where I go present and at the end, the conclusion is, how do you stop migration? How, why are we so obsessed with stopping migration? Because unless you change that mindset, nothing is going to change because you are wasting your energy trying to stop migration. Instead of that, if we are to respect 
people's uh, practices, knowledge, whatever, if that's the strategy that people have said, felt that that's the best given in their particular context and situation, can we start thinking about how could we support them in making their goals and objectives uh, you know, come true? How do you make migration more beneficial for the migrants and their communities? I think that mindset, if you have, that's when then, you know, because then the second thing that, again, Johnny, you mentioned, and what Paul just uh, rightly mentioned here about uh, cooperation, it's vital. It, one ministry cannot deal with migration and its multifaceted impacts. This has to be, uh, you know, um, many uh, stakeholders has to come. When I say ministry, now I'm putting more onus into the government, but not only that. As researchers, for instance, it's a struggle for me to get other colleagues uh, let's try to integrate this in early warning systems or river basin management or even glaciers. You know, and it's, it's everywhere with implementers, with uh, all of us. You know, we have to get out of this sectoral thinking and then try to say this is the ground reality. And if you don't do it, I'm sorry, but we are going to be irrelevant. The, our relevancy will really go. If we are talking about disaster preparedness, we have to consider that uh, population dynamics. If we are working on agriculture sector, we have to consider, again, uh, the population dynamics and the interest of the new generation. For the new, uh, again, another important thing, we always talk about, whenever we talk about migration and climate change, we use vulnerability context. But let's not forget, it's the young people going, and aspiration is equally important. Just because we are interested in climate change angle, we cannot take the aspiration out. For people from Humla, let's say, or even uh, Sindhu Paljok, how many of them can ex you know, have that exposure out of their village from their own pockets? So for a lot of young people, this is also an opportunity to expand their own worldview, to learn something and come back. And again, in migration, we forget, particularly international migration to Gulf countries, they will come back. By the time they are 40 years, all of them are coming back with some money. If not, then at least with a lot of experiences and a lot of zeal. So you are... What do you call that? Bacha bachi gaye, paako vaira pharke. So what do you do with it paako and matured? You know, that's very important. And this, once we take this into consideration, then we start to think about policies, then I think we will go into the right direction. Right now, migration, as I see it, very nicely in background. One paragraph, migration is very important in Himalayas, this, 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 this. And after that, business as usual. You forget about migration. And at the end, most of the programs coming back, this is how we reduce migration. Let's get out of that mindset first. It's a, it's, it can be a catalyst for adaptation for sustainable development. So that is one way. I'm not saying that migration should be an all, that, it, that, that Nepal or the, in the Himalayan countries should only forget, focus on migration. We should have, because the moment there would be enough opportunities locally, people would stop going. I mean, why would people go to earn 5,000 elsewhere when they can earn 15,000 locally? They are not stupid. So I think that's very important. You know, let's start talking about migration across different sectors. Let's uh, get out of that taboo and that, you know, uh, obsession of stopping migration. And second, the sectors, different ministries, different se sectors, different stakeholders. Flip, you and me, we'll have to sit together and design research in future, otherwise that's not possible. I mean, every one of us, of us have to see into these different multifaceted impacts, otherwise these gaps will not be reduced. Great, thank you. Now in terms of one final question related to policy before we move on to audience questions. Um, so, so we've already identified the gaps in policies as well. Can you share a little bit about some of the best practices that other nations in the region have kind of um, adapted to? That's something that we could aspire towards as a country? Well, in terms of uh, best practices that other, other countries have adopted, maybe we have to highlight also, not just within the reason, but maybe we need to look beyond the reason to learn um, uh, the best practices in terms of integrating or creating coherence between different policies, policy regimes, uh, policy regimes. Uh, as, um, Speaker from Ishimor had highlighted uh, there's increasingly higher level of internal migration, uh, internal migration, but then there's no adequate policy and legal response to that in the HKS reason itself. 
generally. So that's something we have to go beyond that in, in, in terms of learning from other countries. And also in terms of, as I highlighted in, in uh, reflecting the national context of policy convergence, um, we can learn from the countries like, let's say, Colombia, where uh, all the NDCs, climate policies, adapted, national adaptation plans, they have the climate and migration angles integrated within their policy process. And that's an example of how a country in a national process create a convergence and coherence within their policy processes. And also there are countries, uh, I, I think that's a report, uh, a research study from IOM itself that reflects that among 66 countries reviewed in this policy coherent, coherence uh, in terms of integrating the migration and displacement, uh, more than 53% of countries have already integrated those provisions within the, their national systems. That's uh, because this is a nascent phase. This is in a nascent phase. It is increasingly growing. The political momentum is gaining uh, lately. And then we can definitely learn from the countries from other parts of the world, not just from the reason in terms of how to create coherence within the different spheres, within different sectors, um, within the climate change regime and also outside of that. So that's, uh, I think we can look beyond the, we have to look beyond in terms of addressing climate, ch uh, climate change and migration issues uh, in, in this context.